This is BSS Sports. Fire to the end zone. It's caught. It's Greg Lewis. Touchdown. Brooks with one. Let's it fly at the horn. It's gone. Here's Crosby with a burst of speed up the middle. Gets open. It's gone. A grand slam for Ayra. Pure genius from David Beckham. And it's in. Terry Henry with a bullet. Touchdown. With Thomas Brooks, Steve Shields, and Trevor Struthers. Only on 91X. Good afternoon. Welcome to a, another episode of BS Sports. My name is Stephen Schill with my partner in crime, Trevor Struthers. The penny was discontinued in Canada until these Olympics, which are now over. And Trevor, have you ever noticed that like these Olympians have like perfect teeth? I don't know what it is, but every time on the podium, it just felt like everybody had shiny white pearls. <laughs> There are some rare exemptions. You notice with the like the track interviews where they get the camera really close to the face, and sometimes it cast, catches them at a bad angle. But I mean, yeah, maybe there's some sort of like uh, toothpaste deal or toothbrush deal with uh, these Olympians. Who knows? Talking about Canada and the Olympics, Penny Alexiak uh, dominating in uh, swimming, getting four medals, and uh, being chosen as Canada's flag bearer uh, for the. Final closing ceremonies, a uh, little argument for Andre de Grasse to have it, although with the way that the women dominated during these Olympics, it wouldn't have really made sense for Andre to do it. I mean, Penny at 16, it's kind of cool. You always want to give it to the younger person, and I bet Andre really didn't care as much as Penny would have. Now, with the golds, we only got a couple. Uh, obviously, Petty got one. Derek Druin got gold in high jump. Rosie McLennan in gymnastics. And Erica Weeb got Canada's fourth gold medal in wrestling, the 75 kilogram. Trevor, what is with the women this year? What is going on? Are women taking over Canada? It's kind of cool to see. I don't know. I think it's kind of a, un- a unique coincidence because... I don't know how like something technically like this could happen, except for the fact that it just happens. Clearly pretty woman-dominated. Three of the four gold medals were women. A large chunk of the medals, because I don't think a, an actual man for Canada won a medal until Andre de Grasse, when track and field actually started up, which was about halfway through the games. That was after the swimming portion. I don't think there were too many real medal opportunities either that Canada missed out on with men early on. It was just a lot for the women. It's tremendous to, to, to see the, 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 the performance that the women were able to put on because, I mean, if they didn't, who knows what this Olympics would have been like uh, for Canada. I mean, right now we're talking about it as one of their best Summer Olympic performances uh, in a long time. And that's, you know, with the men not doing as much as uh, they typically would maybe have to for, for other countries potentially just due to the, the – like, I don't know who sent – I don't know if we sent more women or more men to this Olympics – but, um, I mean, yeah, the women definitely held up their end of the bargain and then some and, uh, you know, gave Canada a chance to finish in the top 10. And I think they just ended up missing out on the top 10 and all said and done uh, in the medal standings. Now, there was an argument being thrown out there that Canada has it too easy to get into the Olympics and you should have the promise and the potential to crack the top eight. And it's expected of you to crack crack the top eight in the main event. Do you think there was any kind of discrepancy between Canada and like allowing people who aren't per se elitists in the athletic field to participate? Well, I mean, they didn't have a, too many gold medals. You know, they only had four. Obviously, the Americans are going to pretty much dominate any Summer Olympic Games. But um, I mean, the performance that they had. I mean, overall medal wise, uh, they're right up there with you know the likes of Italy. They finished ahead of the host Brazil. Um, they finished well, ahead of Jamaica, although Jamaica is not exactly known for meddling a lot, just winning a lot of gold in track. Well, they were supposed right. to, you know, their their whole goal initially was to come 12th overall, and they finished 10th, so technically they surpassed it. Yeah, so they definitely surpassed the goal. They surpassed where they wanted to finish in the medal standings. They surpassed uh, the total amount of, of medals that they wanted to win. They ended up with 22. I think the goal was, you know, 19 or 20, somewhere in there. So, yeah, they're able to surpass expectations. And, I mean, yeah, that's why it holds up. I mean, this is the the most medals that they have won in an Olympics going back to 1996. That was the year I was born, for crying out loud. I mean, I know these happen every four years, but it's been a long time since we've seen a performance like, like this from Canada. The, the only time that where they won more medals was the boycotted Olympics, which were in the 80s, I think. Now, with uh, moving to like a team sport, Christine Sinclair and the women's soccer team, they come third in these soccer games we all remember a while ago at the world cup when they had a fight for bronze when they were 
when they initially lost to the USA and the world decided to watch, uh, it didn't seem like there was as much hype for the women's soccer team around this time. I, I don't really know what exactly it was. I know that, like, hearing about it constantly, but I didn't feel like it was as dominant as the World Cup was. Is there a, a difference between the World Cup and the Olympics? Like, is there one that's bigger than the other? Because I know for men, definitely the World Cup is bigger, but for women... Do you think the World Cup is bigger as well? It's hard to say yes, but uh, it's cool that we got to host, you know, Canada got to host the uh, the w- Women's World Cup when it came around. I mean, it's hard to say. Um, I will tell you that I'm not much of a soccer watcher, but I mean, I do watch this women's national team. I watch them at the World Cup. I've watched them at the 2012 Olympics and the 2016 Olympics. And the most buzz, I think, for them going into a tournament was in 2012, and they ended up uh, winning bronze there. They had a great game against the U.S. in the semifinal there at the 2012 Olympics. Um, I, I, tw- definitely for 2016, I didn't feel that same amount of buzz, but I still felt that there was a lot of expectations, especially with the way they started off. They uh, didn't lose pretty much at all until uh, their their uh, semifinal game to Germany, and they beat Germany in the preliminary round. So there was a lot of expectations, I feel like, and it only you know kind of went up as the as it went on. That loss in the semifinal was a little disheartening, but they were able to win bronze and defend the bronze that they won four years ago. So I mean, it was it was it was fun to watch. Uh, Christine Sinclair didn't quite have as dominant a tournament as she did in 2012, and she's starting to trail off a bit now. Uh, she's still a tremendous player, and and uh, well, I mean, still she's makes plays. she's had 250 appearances and 165 goals, and it doesn't matter who you are in any soccer league. That's an insane record. She is second, I believe, all like for Olympic goal scoring for women. So, and she's you know ahead of Marta. She's ahead of Abby Wambach. Abby Wambach. So. Um, yeah, I mean, she's been a phenomenal player for this team at the Olympics, especially, I mean, because this is only a Canadian team that has contended for a medal, pretty much, or at least, you know, contended for potentially winning a gold medal at, uh, uh, for, you know, for women's soccer at the Olympics for the last, you know, two Olympics. So uh, she's been phenomenal. I don't know if we'll see her again in four years from now, but she's had an incredible career. And uh, it's a nice young team. You know, this is a team that was a little beat up. Uh, Stephanie Labbe was the goaltender, and it was uh, supposed to be Erin McLeod, but she was hurt. She couldn't play at all throughout that, but Labbe had a, a, a tremendous uh, Olympic performance and uh, really gave them a chance to to uh, take that next step and maybe get into the, the gold medal game. They came up a little short. They had an opportunity with the Americans losing to Sweden, but ultimately couldn't capitalize. So we talked a little bit in, th- in other episodes about how in Rio we were expecting, you know, all these problems leading up to it. I mean, there's still a lot of water problems, another thing that's just generally going on, but more specifically Olympic-related. And the only story coming out was the Ryan Lochte thing, which now is being kind of reversed and saying that Lochte was lying about it and there was all this, you know, commotion about the USA swimmers being detained in Brazil and people saying, oh my god, why are they being detained? But really, there was a reason behind it, and because Lochte was making the Brazilian officials look pretty bad. And how bad does this really look on Ryan Lochte? Because sponsorships, whatever, the world now knows who he is, but they know him as a liar. Yeah, well, I mean, this is a guy that, he's not an elite swimmer, but, I mean, he's no Michael Phelps from the same, from the same country that he is. But uh, he, he's also not bad. He's got some medals to to his name, so he's got that going for him. Uh, he had a reality show. I don't know if he still does because I have no interest in watching it. But uh, that, I think that came after the 2012 Olympics. Um, so this is a guy that seems like he really likes that spotlight. And uh, I don't know what happened here. It sounds like they uh, decided at the end of the swimming portion of the Olympics to go out and have a fun night. Apparently they had way too much to drink. Uh, van- vandalized this uh, this gas station, it sounds like. Um Lochte's original story made it sound like they were robbed and said apparently they were just paying for damages. I don't know if there was a gun involved or not, but there might have been. I don't know how exactly the gun rules, especially with uh, you know security guard work in Brazil, but uh, apparently there might have been a, a gun involved, and apparently Lochte was either so out of it that uh, he thought they were somehow being robbed and forgot about the vandalism part. Apparently they kicked down a bathroom door and then some. Um, or he was lying... Um, and apparently he said, I think just the other day, that uh, that uh, story that he told in the first place, I think it was to NBC, but I might be wrong on that. The story that he told uh, right away, the day after it happened, he said he was still drunk when he told that. So uh, um, it doesn't exactly make him look good. 
no matter how you spin this whole thing. Um, I'm still kind of standing by. I think the first person to find out about all this and apparently break the news or something might have been Ryan Lochte's mom. And if that's the case, he may have made up the story just for his mom to uh, <laughs> to avoid getting in trouble, which is funny because he's 30-something years old. He's a good-looking guy. It's like uh, he shouldn't have you – know, he shouldn't be living with his mom or really like worried about getting in trouble by her. But uh, it's just kind of funny that it's like I think Lochte's mom was the first one to break this story and then everybody else kind of came in on it. So, um, I mean, maybe it was just uh, so he, his mom's not like mad at him or something. But uh, it, and it was kind of surprising. I don't know if this was the original plan, but Lottie was back in America the next day after this all happened, and the fellow swimmers that he was with were still in Brazil, and a couple of them ended up being kicked off a plane and kept in Brazil until this whole situation was sorted out. So, I don't know who's the main guy in all of this. I will say Ryan Lochte is the only swimmer I know that was involved in this whole thing, obviously because of that interview that he gave, and he's the biggest name. So it doesn't make him look very good, but there's these other swimmers here that uh, might deserve some of the blame as well. Hey, people love drama, and you know, on the topic of drama, the UFC Conor McGregor versus Nate Diaz number two. All of this commotion... Oh, I'm gonna kill you. Oh, you should have been dead before. All this other stuff. And then what happens? Oh, they only have to go to a decision. And then what does the UFC do? They give it to uh, McGregor so they can sell McGregor versus Diaz number three. This is the biggest publicity stunt that I can possibly think of. I was unable to watch the fight <laughs> from the sheer amount of tweets, Facebook posts, what have you, everybody was saying that Diaz got cheated, and I mean, it's a way for the UFC to make money, because let's face it, there's very few fighters who are very marketable right now, but the McGregor-Diaz thing seems to be one that they can get away with, however, not sure, Trevor, you watched it, your thoughts, give me, give me, the, give me the lowdown. I will say, I follow a lot of MMA people on social media and all over the place, and uh, I have yet to see one person score that fight in favor of Diaz. So I don't know if those are Diaz biased people that you were hearing from, but uh, I mean, one of the judges of the the fight, one of the official uh, judges, scored it a tie. But other than that, I think pretty much everybody might, if not, if they didn't score it a draw, and there were a few that I definitely heard scored it as a draw. There were others that scored it in favor of McGregor. And yeah, like I said, I mean, Diaz, I think. Uh, him winning the fight was the majority, uh, or was the minority of everything. So, uh, well, okay, here's a, here's a question for you that I'll, I'll spin it around. Then Conor I will McG- say, I will say during the fight because you didn't get a chance to watch it. Uh, McGregor knocked Diaz down like three times, and there was only one takedown in the fight that Diaz had. Okay, all right, fair enough. Okay, so for my point then, from like looking it up, do you think there's more haters of McGregor? Is, do you think is that what I read? Because you know what, like I like McGregor, but some people don't like you know the whole upbeat like you know kind of in-your-face attitude that McGregor brings to the table. Obviously, it kind of feels like, to an extent, he's trying to do the whole WWE kind of entertainment style. And, heck, you know, you, it seems like there's also a partnership going on between the two businesses. But, McGregor, do you think there's more hate out there so people just assume that McGregor's worse and they want him to lose and that's why all the hate came out? Yeah, and I think it's on purpose. And, I mean, that's how he sell fights, right? Uh, Chael Sonnen did the exact same thing. He's like Chael Sonnen, but a better fighter is what this is, really, with uh, with Conor McGregor. And, I mean, you had that whole water bottle throwing incident, which I I can't say was staged because I can't see Dana White, well, Dana White signing off on uh, two guys throwing water bottles and monster cans over top of the press like that. Although I know Dana White doesn't necessarily like the press. You had the risk of injuring a fan that was there, um, a press member that was there. So that was kind of insane. And, um, I mean, yeah, I mean, Conor McGregor is a guy that knows how to sell fights. He knows how to talk. He uses that to his advantage. He's, he's, gonna, he's got the win, right? So he's going to get a massive payday, one of the biggest probably in UFC history. And um, so he knows what he's doing. He's great at it. And, I mean, let's face it. I mean, say what you will about the UFC coming more WWE-wise. This is a lot more entertaining than uh, just two guys, you know, showing the respect for each other. And it's like, you know what, I'm just going to go out there and do the best I can. Like, your typical athlete. I mean, this is the stuff that uh, that is really entertaining. And... Um, it was a heck of a fight, too. I mean, you say, you know, it's just a decision. I mean, these, these guys were tr- still trying to go out there, and, and they, they weren't taking it so- softly. I mean, these were just two guys that uh, had the full camps to prepare. 
were prepared uh, physically and mentally and uh, had the stamina to last the five rounds. Yeah, I mean, there was one instance where, or a few couple instances where I thought the fight could have uh, came close to ending, not quite there, but I mean, there were, there were opportunities as that fight went on. That's it for this edition of BSS Sports. My name is Stephen Shield. That is Trevor Struthers. Make sure to follow us on the various social media platforms on Facebook and Twitter at BSS Sports and archiving on YouTube at BSS Productions. We shall catch you next.